Okay, welcome back everyone. This is going to be the GI system practice questions. Um, same format as before. Um, typically give a vignette and um, some questions following. So you can pause it after those initial questions, see if you can think up the answer, and then I'll, then I'll write the answer and give a short explanation. And we'll continue from there. So we'll start off here with GI questions. So this is going to be a patient comes in 45 minutes after ingesting what he states was a half a bottle of Tylenol pills. What's the initial treatment for this patient? 45 minutes in after ingesting a half a bottle of Tylenol pills, how can we work him up? What's the antidote for this overdose? And necrosis of what organ is in jeopardy? So how do we work him up, antidote, and necrosis of what organ is in jeopardy? So that's going to be activated charcoal since it's under an hour. So this guy was 45 minutes, so you want to do activated charcoal for under an hour since the pills are not fully digested yet. Use the nomogram to follow the APAP levels. So that's how we'd want to work them up as well. So we want to use that nomogram to give us a curve for the APAP level. And then we also want to get LFT since it has to do with the liver. And liver necrosis is what can occur. And of course, also PT, PTT, and INR. Remember, the liver creates those coagulation factors 2, 7, 9, and 10 in the intrinsic pathway and extrinsic. So we want to get those to kind of trend those to see the liver damage that's taking place. And the antidote is N-acetylcysteine, NAC, N-acetylcysteine. That's a glutathione substitute, so it helps with the antioxidants and decreasing the liver damage. So next one is, a patient comes in and states that he took way too much of an over-the-counter acid reliever and stomach protectant that has, had, that has the side effects of black tongue and stool. What is this? So what did he overdose on? It has the side effects of a black tongue and stool. And it also helps to relieve acid and is a stomach protector. What type of metabolic derangement would be expected in this? And what are three things we can do for him as treatment? So that's going to be bismuth subsalicylate. So it's an ASA derivative. So bismuth subsalicylate. And remember that has the black tongue and black stool side effects. And remember, it's a high anion gap metabolic acidosis. So remember it's from our mud pilers mnemonic that high anion gap metabolic acidosis. We can do activated charcoal, lavage, as well as alkalinization of the urine, importantly, with bicarb. And if refractory to all that, and it's, they're still um, decompensating, we can do hemodialysis for these patients. So again, high anion gap metabolic acidosis with an ASA toxicity. This has subsalicylate in it, in the bismuth. Activated charcoal, alkalinization of the urine, and hemodialysis. So next one, what is contraindicated if a strong base is consumed? So what do we want to not do if we know that they consumed a strong base? What are some anticholinergics that could be overdosed on? What are some anticholinergics that could be overdosed on? Just examples of the drugs. What symptoms would we see in an anticholinergic overdose? And what is the general anticholinergic treatment? So we want to not do gastric lavage in a base overdose. So no gastric lavage in a base overdose, it makes it worse. Remember, the base is actually worse than acids, and you want to prevent them from actually having emesis because it could tear up the esophagus and potentially perforate it. Some examples of anticholinergics, that would be like TCAs, tricyclic antidepressants. Benadryl has anticholinergic properties as well as antihistamines, and antihistamines, and atropine, and there's many more. So we'd see anti-sludge effects. So that's the salivation, lacrimation, urination, defecation, GI, and uh, meiosis. So in this case, we'd see mydriasis. So we'd see the opposite of that. So no salivation, dry mouth, dry eyes, urinary retention, perhaps, etc. So also tachycardic. And the treatment for that would be physostigmine. So physostigmine, if you remember, that's an acetylcholine ester ACE inhibitor. So it inhibits acetylcholine ester ACE, which would typically break down the acetylcholine in the synapse. So it's increasing that acetylcholine in the synapse. Next one, what does TCA toxicity show on EKG? So what does TCA toxicity show on EKG? What's the antidote for TCA toxicity? So TCAs, got to know that it has QT prolongation. Also note sodium bicarb is the antidote for TCA toxicity. And also note that some of the side effects of TCA overdose is going to be seizures as well. And for that, we should use lorazepam. 
What then would we see in a cholinergic overdose? So we just went over anticholinergic overdose. What then would we see in a cholinergic overdose? What are some examples of cholinergics? And what is the treatment for this? So what would we see in a cholinergic overdose? What are some examples of cholinergic drugs? And what is the treatment for this? So we'd see the sludge side effects, salivation, lacrimation, urination, defecation, GI, and eyes or emesis. And they'll be meiotic in this case. And also pesticides and insecticides are examples, organophosphates, and also atropine plus pralidoxime is the treatment. So examples are pesticides and insecticides and organophosphates, and the treatment is atropine and pralidoxime. So next one, a mom comes in with a young child who just learned to walk and has noticed her prenatal vitamins are now gone when there was a half a bottle yesterday. So the infant is getting curious, just learning how to walk and starts grabbing things and prenatal vitamins are now gone. There was a half a bottle yesterday. What kind of um, overdose are you concerned for in this patient? So what kind of overdose are you concerned for in this patient? What is a must know classical treatment for this overdose? And that's going to be uh, deferoxamine. So deferoxamine is that classic overdose treatment for an iron overdose. And of course, iron is in uh, prenatal vitamins. So that's that. And of course, if deferoxamine doesn't work, we can still do irrigation if under an hour and hemodial hemodialysis if severe as well. Okay, so now we'll just do a couple quick, a quick active recall ones. So I'm going to be naming the poison, and uh, we should name the antidote. So we should know the antidote for these different poisons here, or medications in whatever case you're giving them. So first one, amphetamines. So what's the antidote for an amphetamine overdose? Amphetamines, think am, amphetamines. Opioids, what do we give for opioids? How about for benzos? What do we give for benzos? Beta blockers, what do we give for a beta blocker overdose? Warfarin, what do we give for a warfarin overdose? Heparin, and this is a classic question. I got asked this a ton of times in, uh, in rotations. So heparin, what is the antidote for heparin? And also TPA, so like streptokinase, um, tenecteplase, what do we give for TPA overdose? So first one's going to be ammonium chloride. So that's amphetamine for ammonium chloride. That's the antidote for that. Naloxone, of course, for opioid overdose, naloxone. For benzodiazepines, that's going to be flumazenil. Flumazenil for benzodiazepines. Glucagon for beta blockers. So beta blocker overdose, glucagon you can give. For warfarin, that's going to be vitamin K and fresh frozen plasma if you need to. And that's especially if the INR is over 10. So they're going to be super therapeutic. You want to give vitamin K. Remember that works on that extrinsic pathway on factor 7. And FFP. For heparin, it's going to be protamine sulfate, protamine sulfate, and for TPA, that's going to be amino caproic acid. So amino, amino caproic acid for TPA. Okay, next one. Next one's a 40-year-old female. She has a temperature of 101, a BMI of 43, and she comes in with one-day history of acute onset of sharp right upper quadrant pain that is non-remitting. She states this has been precipitated by a meal of hot dogs and french fries. What is this a classic presentation of? So this is a very classic presentation here. Where exactly is her problem, is her obstruction? So where exactly is her obstruction? What are the most common organisms in this case? So that kind of clues you in. What are the most common organisms in this case? What are the two classic physical exam signs that might be um, shown here? What might we see? on the best initial test. So what is the best initial test basically and then what might what might we see on it as well? What are some of the findings? What will we see in the most definitive test as well? And lastly, what is the treatment sequence? So quite a few uh, questions here. One more time. Where is the obstruction? What are the common organisms? What are the two classic physical exam signs? What do we see on the best initial test? What will we see in the most definitive test? And what is the treatment sequence? in this for this lady here. So this is cholecystitis. Remember we saw her, she had a fever, all those classic signs. And this is obstruction at the cystic duct. So remember how it goes. So there's a hepatic duct, which links up with the cystic duct. 
and that forms a common bile duct before heading into the pancreas and out into the duodenum. So this is in the cystic duct still, so not the common bile duct. That's why we don't see any jaundice in cholecystitis because it's not blocking the outflow of bile from the liver in this case. Um, so E. coli is the most common bug, and this is followed by Klebsiella as the second most common, but mostly E. coli. And the two classic physical exam signs, that's going to be Murphy's sign, which is when you palpate under the right costal margin under the rib while they're inhaling, and they'll have a quick, sharp pain, um, which stops them from inhaling, basically. And so that's indicative of cholecystitis or gallbladder pathology there. Also, Boa's sign. Boa's sign is phrenic nerve irritation on the right side that radiates to the scapula or the shoulder. And remember, also, the left side is the Kerr sign when you have that phrenic nerve irritation. So Kerr sign is on the left side, Boa's sign is on the right side, and that's the phrenic nerve. Um, the best test initially is ultrasound, and we would see on ultrasound if it was positive, pericholocystic fluid, so fluid around peri, the gallbladder, and we'd also see thick, distended gallbladder, and also potentially a sonographic Murphy sign, so basically a Murphy sign when you were pressing in with the ultrasound probe into that right upper quadrant. The most definitive test, however, is a HIDA scan, and in a HIDA scan, we see visualization of the gallbladder. So in a HIDA scan, we we won't see visualization in the gallbladder if it's positive because that fluid, that contrast can't get in there. And so for the HIDA scan, they basically inject something. And if, if they're not seeing any uptake in the gallbladder, then they can give something like cholecystic kinin to stimulate it uh, to see if there's any uptake. And if there's not, we know there's an obstruction there. So the HIDA scan is that definitive test for the gallbladder pathology, cholecystitis specifically. Um, the treatment sequence, we want to make them NPO, give them IV fluids, give them antibiotics, and remember we're covering free E. coli and potentially Klebsiella, so ceftriaxone, gram-negative coverage, and also flagell, flagell so metronidazole, covers anaerobes, um, and also a lap coli in under 72 hours we want to do for that patient. So a patient is in the ICU and has multiple comorbidities. They complain of right upper quadrant pain and you order an ultrasound. The ultrasound shows a distended gallbladder with pericholocystic fluid. However, it has no stone or calcifications that are seen. The patient is febrile and is on antibiotics already. What condition would you consider in this patient? So they already have comorbidities, they're in the ICU. They have a distended gallbladder and pericholocystic fluid, but no stone or calcifications importantly are seen. What do you, th what do you think it is? That's going to be acute acalculus cholecystitis. Acute acalculus cholecystitis. Common in ICU patients, in very sick patients, but no actual calcifications in the gallbladder. Next one is a patient that comes in with three days of fever, chills, and right upper quadrant pain, and they have jaundice. You also note that they're starting to deteriorate to deteriorate with a blood pressure of 87 over 46 and a heart rate of 129. He seems unable to answer any questions you have and is disoriented. So disoriented, high heart rate, low blood pressure, classic things of fever, chills, right upper quadrant pain, and jaundice. What does he have? What is the classic constellation of symptoms seen here called? So what is this constellation of symptoms actually called? What is the diagnosis caused by? So what is the actual cause of this condition? What is a cholestatic pattern on labs? So like which labs would be elevated in this cholestatic pattern? What is in the initial test that you should do? What's the most accurate test that should, you should do? And what's the gold standard test? So a few things to know here. Initial, most accurate, and gold standard. And what is an ERCP and what does it do? So quite a few questions here for this vignette. So this is the Reynold, Reynolds Pentad. So remember the Charcot's is the right upper quadrant pain, fever, and jaundice. But you add two things, which is the altered mental status and hypotension, and that makes it the Reynolds Pentad. And that's classic for this, acute ascending cholangitis. So it's important to know the acute ascending cholangitis. And this is E. coli, again, most common. And this is, however, a block in the common bile duct. So that's why we're getting that jaundice, because it's backing up to the cystic and hepatic ducts. And we have a subsequent infection after that. So the blockage leads to the stasis, and wherever the stasis can increase the risk for infection. So we have a subsequent infection in this patient, and that leads to their following symptoms. 
The cholestatic pattern is going to be increased ALK-FOS, increased GGT, which is very specific for biliary pathology, increased bilirubin, of course, but not really increased AST or ALT yet. So it hasn't uh, backed up and led to the liver bleeding out any of its, um, any of its enzymes. We also see leukocytosis. So initially, the best thing to do is an ultrasound, of course. The most accurate is an MRCP as just an imaging study. But remember, the MRCP is not therapeutic. It's just diagnostic. Whereas the gold standard, which is the ERCP, is diagnostic and therapeutic because you can actually do something. So after you stabilize them, you want to do that ERCP, endoscopic retrograde cholangiopancreatography, which actually goes in and it can do a sphincterotomy to the sphincter vodi as well as extract the stone and basically decompress all that swelling in the area. So you want to give them antibiotics, sphincterotomy once they're stable, and stone extraction with that decompression. And also remember a side effect of potentially ERCP is iatrogenic pancreatitis too because you could perforate or somehow damage the pancreas as you bypass that going up the biliary tract. So next one, a 45-year-old female has intermittent right upper quadrant pain for one week. She states it is on and off and has not had any fever. The pain lasts about an hour after eating and subsequently remits. She's on a diet and has lost 25 pounds due to exercise and calorie restriction. Her efforts stem from attempting to get off her fibrate medication, her fibrate medication, as she has had elevated triglycerides. She's also on an OCP, so a lot of clues here to what this might be. So OCP, fibrates, elevated triglycerides, loss, a lot of weight loss, 25 pounds, even though it is from exercise and calorie restriction, and intermittent on and off pain for about an hour after, after eating with remission. So what is her diagnosis? What is her diagnosis? She's also a 45-year-old female, which is classic for something too. So what's her diagnosis? What are the three types of stones, which kind of gives you there the answer. What are the three types of stones that are common? And that's going to be cholithiasis. So this is cholelithiasis. And remember, this is the stone that hasn't quite gotten to the common bile duct. It's just basically bobbing its head in and out of the cystic duct and hasn't really caused any, infl hasn't really caused any fever yet or anything or infection like that yet. So that's just cholelithiasis just gallbladder stones. They could even be in the gallbladder. Cholesterol is the most common type of stone. Black stones would be common in hemolysis. And also important to know brown stones in any parasitic or bacterial infection as well. So next one is a patient that comes in with right upper quadrant pain that has lasted six hours. So right upper quadrant for six hours. He states that he has felt this pain before, but never to this extent and duration, where it's usually lasted only 30 minutes after a meal. On exam, you notice yellowing of the, of the eyes and under his tongue. He, he also has no fever and the vitals are stable. What's this diagnosis? What is the management for this condition? And what's, what are going to be elevated on labs? So management, labs, and what is this diagnosis? It's lasted six hours, only 30 minutes after a meal. It's getting worse. And now you're starting to notice jaundice, yellowing of the eyes and under the tongue, but also also pretty stable, uh, no fever. So this is going to be cholidocolithiasis. So cholidocolithiasis is different, where cholidocolithiasis is basically a cholelithiasis, but it has now progressed to the common bile duct. So this is when it gets into the common bile duct. So it's a, it's a stone that's gotten to the common bile duct, and now we're seeing jaundice because that backs up into the hepatic duct. We want to do an ERCP. Um, cholestatic pattern will show GGT elevation, ALK-FOS, of course, bilirubin, and maybe is it as it continues to back up and progress, AST and ALT elevation as the liver begins to get inflamed. So next one is a four-day-old infant that comes in with his mom, and his mom's worried that she's noticed some yellowing of the skin and sclera of the baby. She's been breastfeeding, but states that she's really not producing enough milk for the baby, and the baby's also not really pooping that much as well. So not having good bowel movements, not getting enough milk, and a little bit of jaundice here with the skin and sclera in a four-day-old infant. What's the pathophysiology behind this and what's going on? And what is the risk of a severe case of this leading to? So what is the risk of a severe case of this leading to? Also, what is the treatment for this condition? 
So this is physiologic jaundice, and this is in the first three to five days of life. This was a four-year-old, a four-day, a four-day-old infant. So what the patho is is decreased UGT enzyme capacity, um, lack of liver maturity as well. But also in this case, the mother's lack of breast milk production leads to less bowel movements and less ability to bind and excrete the bilirubin through the bowel movements. So if we're not giving enough breast milk, we're not able to clear the bilirubin with bowel movements, and it kind of builds up. And naturally, the liver needs some time to mature as well. So we're going to have that decreased UGT um, glucuronyl transferase production, which is the enzyme that conjugates the bilirubin. So we're going to have that buildup of uh, unconjugated bilirubin in the first few days of life as well. The severe case of this can lead to kernicterus, and phototherapy for all is the treatment, kernicterus. So next one, you have been monitoring an infant whose bilirubin was elevated in day one of life, and it's now been two weeks and it's still elevated. You notice the bilirubin has been increasing slightly every day. At what level would you consider kernicterus? So what level of bilirubin would you consider the kernicterus? And you notice it's been steadily increasing the bilirubin from day one to two weeks now. What are some of the causes of prehepatic jaundice? So now you're starting to consider something more, um, more serious now. So what are some of the causes of prehepatic jaundice? How about posthepatic? What are the causes of posthepatic jaundice? So over 20 is kernicterus. So over 20 grams per deciliter is kernicterus of bilirubin. And the older the infant, the higher the tolerance for the total bilirubin. So the older the infant, the higher the tolerance. So basically, if they're three days old, they need over 18. Whereas if they're only one day old, over 12 is going to be concerning, in which they should get photo treatment. So over uh, just over one day, over 12, they're going to need photo treatment. But the bilirubin can be up to 18 if they're three days old. Prehepatic will be Gilbert's syndrome and also Krigner, Krigler in the jar. So prehepatic, Gilbert's and Krigler in a jar. How I remember that is GCN. And then post is DJ. So post is DJ, that's Dubin Johnson syndrome. You can also think like hemolysis and cretinism can lead to can lead to this type of jaundice too. But the ones you want to remember for prehepatic are GCN and posthepatic DJ, Dubin Johnson. Okay, next one. What condition is associated with black liver on biopsy? So what is associated with a black liver on biopsy? What is the pathology of Krigler-Najjar syndrome? What is the pathology of Krigler-Najjar syndrome? And what are the two types of Krigler-Najjar syndrome? So Dubin-Johnson syndrome, that's going to be the grossly black liver. So Dubin-Johnson syndrome, grossly black liver. Krigler-Najjar is due to a decrease of UGT, and it can be type 1, which is no UGT at all, or type 2, which is Arius syndrome, which still has some. So this is kind of like type 2 diabetes, where over time, we get that decreased production of insulin, whereas type 1 diabetes, we don't produce any insulin at all. So this is analogous to that, where type 2, Arias syndrome, we still do produce a little bit, but type 1, Krigler-Najjar, we don't produce any. And so that's going to be obviously more severe. Again, type 1 typically is bad and can lead to connectoris. And you can give phenobarbital for type 2 because it's been shown to increase that UGT activity. Again, the glucuronyl transferase enzyme that conjugates the bilirubin. That's what we need here, and that's what we're deficient in. But the phenobarbital is the treatment for type 2, area syndrome, krigler najjar <clears throat> Next one, how common is Gilbert's syndrome? So we said that's another prehepatic cause, GCN. Gilbert's and krigler jar are prehepatic. How common is this Gilbert's syndrome? When is Gilbert's syndrome worse? What makes it worse? And what is the pathophysiology of Gilbert's syndrome? So again, how common is it? When is it worse? And what is the pathology? So it's very common, Gilbert's. It's estimated to be 5 to 10% of the United States population, actually. And like many conditions, it's worse in periods of stress that would lead to decreased UGT activity. That's 10 to 30% of the normal activity. So it's not as bad as area syndrome and curricular jar, but it's still pretty bad. So 10 to 30% of the normal. And this would be in things like such as fasting, um, periods of stress, like we said, alcohol, illness, and also physiologic stress on the body, like surgery, for instance. Which is more sensitive for liver cell disease, ALT or AST? So now getting into some uh, 
LFTs. So which is the more sensitive for liver disease itself, AST or ALT? What are the two most common problems that arise when liver synthetic function is diminished? So two most common problems that arise when liver synthetic function, the stuff that liver makes, is diminished. And a couple of pop quizzes here. The AST is 450 and the, AL and the ALT is 160. What is the most likely disorder? So ALT is less than the AL AST in this case. The AST is more than 2 to 1 ratio. What is that? Next one is the ALT is 1,250 and the AST is 1,000. What are you thinking in this case? So we have real elevated LFTs in this case. And last one is if the ALP, the ALKFOS, is elevated, but the GGT, something very specific for biliary conditions, is not, what would you be thinking of? So a couple good questions here. So ALT, so L is specific for liver, so ALT is more specific for liver disorders than AST. For liver synthetic function problems, it's going to be albumin, as well as coagulopathies, because we can't synthesize factor 2, 7, 9, and 10. And the albumin is going to be more of a later finding in deterioration than the synthetic um, problems with the factors there. And likely alcohol. So S is for scotch. So like we said, the ASD was more elevated than the ALT in alcoholic cirrhosis or alcoholic fatty liver or just problems because of uh, alcoholism. So we're going to look for an over 2 to 1 ratio of ASD to ALT. But it's going to still be under 500. When we see over 500 or even over 1,000, that's going to be acute viral hepatitis. So chronic is typically under 500 for hepatitis, but acute viral hepatitis, we want to be looking at the thousands for those ALT and AST. And we also noticed here it was 1,250 ALT and AST of 1,000. So the ALT is typically going to be a little bit more because it's a liver-focused enzyme. But uh, over 1,000, that's going to be acute viral hepatitis. And also, um, remember GGT is most specific for biliary pathology. So an ALKFOS also makes you think of other disorders like Paget's disease of the bone or other systemic or bone disease. So without GGT, you want to be thinking of other systemic conditions with ALKFOS being, so, being the only thing elevated. Next one, we'll go into some other topics here. What are the bulk forming laxatives? What are the osmotic laxatives? Just the names of them here. What are the stimulant laxatives? And how do you treat fecal impaction? So a couple important things to know about fecal impaction. So what are the bulk forming? What are the osmotic? What are the stimulant? How do you treat the fecal impaction? So how I remember this is a, is a mnemonic PMPW. Those are the bulk forming. And those are psyllium, methyl cellulose, polycarbophyll, and wheat dextran. So PMPW, psyllium, methyl cellulose, polycarbophyll, and wheat dextran. And then PEGLs is how I remember osmotic. So PEGLs, polyethylene glycol is osmotic. Also lactulose is osmotic. Um, saline as well, and uh, sorbitol, which is an undigestible sugar basically, and also saline, which is milk of magnesia and another magnesium one too. So polyethylene glycol, osmotic, lactulose, saline, and sorbitol are the osmotic. And BS are the stimulating ones, so b and senna, docusate sodium. So BS are the stimulating ones. How do you treat fecal impaction? It's going to be manually disimpacted followed by a warm water enema, and you can use mineral oil as well, and then give polyethylene glycol after that osmotic diuretic, I mean osmotic uh, laxative. Next one, patient comes in with pain upon coughing, defecation, and is febrile. He is noted to have some edema around the posterior anal area with induration. There is notable fluctuance, and it is more painful when he sits down. What is it? How do we differ it from a fistula? And what is the treatment for this? So what is it? How do we differ it from fistula? And what is the treatment? It's um, some edema, some fluctuance. It's more painful when he sits. It's a posterior anal area with induration. So that's going to be an anorectal abscess. So we differ this from a fistula because a fistula will have drainage from a tract as more likely of a symptom. So remember, a fistula is a connection, basically like a hole between two areas in a body cavity. So fistula is going to have that drainage, whereas an abscess is just going to be more fluctuant and indurated. The treatment is the mnemonic wash, warm water, 
warm water cleansing, analgesics, sits, baths, and a high fiber diet. Antibiotics are not usually required, even though it is an abscess, an anorectal abscess. We're just going to do our wash mnemonic. Again, warm water, analgesics, sits, baths, and high fiber diet. And that's for anorectal abscess. Next one. A young man reports severe anal pain when having a bowel movement, and he says this makes him not want to have a bowel movement. He occasionally notes bright red blood on the toilet paper. What is it? So again, a young man, severe anal pain when having a bowel movement, and it makes him not want to have the bowel movement. And he also notes some bright red blood after wiping on the toilet paper. What is this? Where is this most commonly found anatomically? And also, what is the treatment for this condition? So what is the treatment for this condition? So this is going to be an anal fissure. So young man, more common for having an anal fissure. Posterior midline is the most common in men 99% of the time, and in females 90% of the time. Skin tags, if it's chronic, important to know. Most resolve spontaneously. However, you can do warm sits baths, high fiber diet, and if severe and refractory, you can do topical nitroglycerin or nifedipine ointment as well. So don't forget about that nifedipine ointment there for the anal fissure. Next one is a patient that comes in stating he has been uncomfortable with sitting on the toilet and has been noticing some rectal bleeding without pain, however. So rectal bleeding without pain, uncomfortable sitting on the toilet. He says he sees a bulge out of his anus while defecating, but when he stands up, it goes away on its own without him doing anything. It goes away on its own. What degree specifically is this condition? So what degree specifically? So again, some of the most important things, uncomfortable sitting on the toilet, there's been some rectal bleeding without pain. There's a bulge from his anus while defecating, but when he stands up, it does go away on its own. What is the degree? What would you think if it was painful, but it didn't bleed? So if it didn't bleed, but it was painful. How about if it did not spontaneously reduce and he had to manually push it back in and then it reduced? What is the anatomical mark between the internal and external pathologies in this condition? So a couple go a couple important things to consider. What if it was painful but didn't bleed, as opposed to his, which was uh, not having pain but did have bleeding? Okay, so he's having a stage 2 internal hemorrhoid. So remember, internal hemorrhoid. So typically the internal, not painful, but they do bleed. Stage 1 of the internal does not prolapse. Stage 2 is what he's having. It prolapses, and then it comes and it goes back up automatically without having to do anything. Stage three will prolapse and require manual reduction. So if the vignette said that he had to manually reduce it and put it back in, that would be a stage three. And of course, stage four does not reduce even with manual intervention. He can't even put it in back in himself. And if it was painful with no bleeding, you'd think more external. So if it's more painful, but typically no bleeding and external, and also the marker between internal and external, that's of course gonna be the dentate line or I've seen pectinate line too. So dentate line is that anatomical marker that we have to know for hemorrhoids. Next one, what are the four risk factors for hemorrhoids? And what is the sequence of management for hemorrhoids? So it's important to know, sometimes they'll quiz you on what exactly do you wanna do for management of hemorrhoids? And of course, what are some risk factors? So what are four risk factors for hemorrhoids? Risk factors are obesity, of course, pregnancy, cirrhosis with portal hypertension, the venous plexuses, remember, backs up, and also prolonged sitting and straining for a bowel movement, constipation. So obesity, pregnancy, cirrhosis, prolonged sitting and straining as well. And you want, of course, with hemorrhoids, start with a high fiber diet, sits, baths for the pain, increase their fluids so the stool is more bulky. Remember, that's what the large colon does. And then progress to rubber band ligation, which is better than sclerotherapy. So sometimes they ask you, what do you want to do? It's uh, progressed. They tried all the conservative measures. What do you want to do? Rubber band ligation or sclerotherapy? And you should choose rubber band ligation. That's typically better than the sclerotherapy from the resource I was using. Then if it's not still responding or a stage four, you can do a hemorrhoidectomy. But definitely know that band ligation over sclerotherapy. Okay, next one is a 75-year-old female that comes in with painless rectal bleeding for a couple days. What is the first thing you think of based on not knowing, based on knowing what is most common? So she's 75, it's a female, and she's having painless rectal bleeding for a couple days. So basically, what's the most common cause 
of an adult with painless rectal bleeding. What is the pathophysiology of this condition? Where anatomically is the most common for incidence? However, where anatomically is the most common for bleeding? So that gives you a little bit of clue if you don't know what it is. What is the best test for this condition? And what are the three biggest risk factors overall for this condition? Okay, again, pathophysiology, 75-year-old woman, what is the most common condition for her to have uh, painless rectal bleeding, incidence, and best test and risk factors? So this is uh, painless rectal bleeding is most commonly caused by diverticulosis, which is an outpouching in the colon due to increased pressure over time, causes outpouchings in the submucosa and mucosa. It's most commonly in the left colon and sigmoid due to the pressure being more narrow. So the left side is more now as it tapers off and goes into the sigmoid, the left, col the left colon as well. And most common for bleeding is in the right colon. So the right colon has a larger diameter right after the cecum. It has a larger diameter overall. And so bleeding is more common in that area. Whereas in, again, in the left side, more pressure, therefore more pressure are gonna push on the colon wall itself and can cause those outpouchings. Um, so colonoscopy is the test of choice for diverticulosis, but perhaps not diverticulitis. So diverticulosis, you want to do colonoscopy. And it helps rule out colon cancer too, so that could be on your suspicion as well, since she's 75, painless rectal bleeding. But the most common is going to be diverticulosis, but you definitely want to do a colonoscopy to rule out colon cancer. And some of the risk factors, the three biggest, are going to be obesity, again, increasing the intra-abdominal pressure, pushing on the intestine. Low fiber diet, if you're straining, you're going to cause more outpouchings as well. And of course, constipation as well goes hand in hand with high fiber diet, with a low fiber diet rather. Okay, next one is a patient that's 65 years old, comes in with, with fever and left lower quadrant abdominal pain. What are you thinking of right away? So again, 65 years old, fever now, and left lower quadrant abdominal pain. What are you thinking of right away? What is the pathology for this condition? What is the best test? Very important to know the best test for this. And what is the treatment? So again, 65, again, an older person, <laughs> fever and left lower quadrant abdominal pain. What are you thinking of? Okay, so diverticulitis in this patient. So not osis, but itis. Now they have a fever, signs of infection. You wanna be thinking diverticulitis. These are outpouchings again. They've begun to have micro perforations and they're leading to inflammation, infection, and necrosis and possible progression to an abscess or fistula. So again, now it's taking on a more severe form um, as it progresses to diverticulitis and potentially abscess. You don't wanna do uh, a colonoscopy in these patients because of the risk for perforation. So you wanna do a CT if you're suspecting diverticulitis. And why would you suspect that? Because of the fever, the signs of instability as well and inflammation. So it's, it, if it's complicated, um, you have to admit them, but if it's uncomplicated, you can do outpatient um, antibiotics orally with Cipro or metronidazole for 7 to 10 days. So Cipro and metronidazole for 7 to 10 days, outpatient if they're stable. And if there is evidence of an abscess, you might need to do CT-guided drainage if it's complicated. A question I got before was they had what sounded like diverticulitis for like 8 days, and they wanted you to suspect that it was an abscess as opposed to just diverticulitis. So in that case, you would want to do the CT guided drainage, and they also should be admitted for IV, Cipro and Metro, or other combination similar to that, and IV, not orally outpatient. So if they appear stable, again, orally outpatient, Cipro, Metro, for 7 to 10 days. Next one, profound bloody diarrhea and colonic dilation of greater than 6 centimeters as well as signs of systemic toxicity, makes you think of what? So profound bloody diarrhea, colonic dilation greater than six centimeters, and systemic toxicity is what? What are the risk factors or complications that would lead to this condition? So that's gonna to be toxic megacolon. Some of the risk factors are ulcerative colitis, C. diff can lead to that, as well as pseudomembranous colitis, ischemic colitis, volvulus, as well as diverticulosis as well as diverticulosis. So with that, I think we'll pause for this first episode and we'll continue with um, episode two of the GI practice questions.